Washington, D.C., this is Audio Digest Surgery, Volume 17, Number 9, bringing you highlights from the American College of Surgeons sectional meeting. The coming hour's listening includes a special lecture on hazards in the operating room, a three-man discussion, the surgeon looks at operating room environment and two clinical papers, hypertonic solutions in parenteral nutrition of critically ill patients, and advances and controversies in surgery of the esophagus. First on the program, our special lecture, Carl W. Walter of Harvard Medical School discussing some often overlooked hazards in the operating room. We all think of the first item of safety as a hygienic environment in which to work, but very few of us recognize how simple this is to attain. Two things we need to do. One is adequate housekeeping. This involves care largely of the horizontal surfaces. It's surprising to see that you can get rid of most of the particulate matter in the operating room by flooding the floor once a day and picking it up with a wet vacuum. The second item is to be certain that paper products are not abandoned into the laundry because they dissolve in the washer wheel, come back, spread thinly over all the textiles, and hence get back into the air. The third thing is to keep the mop out of the opting room because as you use a mop, you abrade it on the floor, and that abraded textile gets back into the air. Ventilation is a very poor mimic of what it could be in even a new operating room. We need relative humidity control just for the sake of preserving the mucous membranes of the staff in a healthy condition and also protecting the mucous membranes of the patient. It also aids in eliminating electrostatic hazard and the inconvenience of involuntary movements due to electrostatic discharge. The rate of ventilation is important. When you get up around 25 or 30 air changes per hour, the dilution of particulates and bacteria is such that there really is not much problem with keeping sterile air. Then we have the problem of asepsis in the operating room. We need to bear down largely on dispensing techniques. We need to look at anesthesia and the anesthetist as a big unsolved sector of contamination. We need to look at parenteral medication as a big unsolved parameter of cross-infection. I not only refer to techniques of venipuncture and maintaining the venipuncture site aseptic, but look at the equipment and see how it is contaminated during use, and look at the drugs and make sure that every patient has his medication from a freshly opened ampule or a freshly opened vial, and the multiple dose ampule and the multiple dose vial should be eliminated from hospital practice. We have the problem of anesthetic safety, and here we have flammable anesthetics as the leading problem, and this introduces the whole realm of the control of electrostatic electricity, partly by relative humidity, partly by eliminating the electrifiable materials out of the operating room, and partly by providing a conductive pathway to prevent the accumulation of electrostatic charges, and then lastly, by eliminating spark from various electrical gear in the operating room. This is done largely by using an isolated power supply, making sure that the insulation on all the cords is intact and that frayed insulin cords are discarded rather than used, and making sure that electrosurgery is not used on a patient who's had either a flammable germicide applied to disinfect his skin or is having a flammable anesthetic administered. The last six deaths from anesthetic explosion that I have been able to review have been due to the use of electrosurgery while flammable anesthetics are being administered. The new problem in one sense and yet an old problem in another is that of electric shock. We have two varieties here to look for. One is live conductor shock when a patient our personnel conducts a hot wire and is also in contact with a grounded object and becomes shocked. The isolated power system goes a long way to eliminate this. The other is more complex and subtle, that is leakage currents coming in contact with electrodes that are connected to vital organs such as the nervous system or the heart. And here we have grounding as a means of protection, a new 
subtle but enormously important safety measure that you must all learn about and master. Electric shock in the operating room can only be eliminated if there is a complete testing program that demonstrates periodically that electric gear is safe to use. Many hospitals are embarrassed by power failure at crucial moments. They do not have adequate wiring, adequate segregation of wiring, or adequate emergency power supplies to take over in the event that there is a utility power failure, and most of them do not have any protection at all for internal faults in the distribution system within the hospital. Few of them have thought about providing uninterruptible power for vital life support equipment. Operating rooms should have task illumination throughout the suite so that people can carry on their activities in the event of power failure. They need surgical illumination so the surgeon can see what he's doing, and they need enough power to keep equipment that supports the patient going. When hospitals get into difficulty with fire, there is always a smoke hazard in the operating room because more and more of these facilities are relegated to the core where ventilation by opening the window is impossible. We do need some sort of automatic ventilation in the event that fire occurs in each operating room. This does no good if the ventilating air comes from a hazardous area and there have been operating room fires where the smoke brought in by the ventilator was worse than that which existed in the operating room. So here again, we need good architectural supervision and realistic location of the air intakes. Most of the fires in operating rooms are electric fires, which make a great deal of acrid smoke, and this must be purged. I have recently seen one hospital that had adequate ventilating equipment in the operating room, but the very fire that caused the smoke also took out the power supply and the ventilators weren't hooked to the emergency power, so they were all choked up with smoke. We need badly to recognize the occupational hazard of working in hospitals, particularly the operating room. The single biggest factor is hepatitis, which takes more and more toll among people who handle instruments, needles, and come in contact with blood. We need to train our people not to touch blood, to avoid it, because you never know which patient is a latent carrier of hepatitis virus. We must terminally sterilize every instrument, syringe, needle, and so on, before it is processed through a supply room or before it is discarded. We must look to trash disposal to be sure that that can be safely handled by the untrained people that we require to remove the trash in increasing quantities from our hospital. The fire problem in operating rooms is increasing, largely because of the increasing use of disposable supplies with their fancy packages. In a wastebasket, this is highly flammable, puts out acrid smoke and a tremendous amount of heat. So we must remember to keep the trash moving, do not let it accumulate, and be sure that it's disposed of safely. The big causes of fire in the operating room are electric sparks from frayed insulation on cords, from faulty receptacles and faulty plugs. These can all be controlled by never using a frayed cord or a faulty plug, and the only way to prevent its use is to cut it off as soon as you detect it, and then it will be repaired. If you just put it in the corner, some other naive person will use it and get into difficulty. The second most frequent cause of fire in the operating room is overheating of electronic equipment. And as we get more and more equipment that is designed by enthusiasts who are looking at the function of the equipment and not its safety, you will find fires ever more frequent. The public is protected by a statistic, for example, GE and RCA have been required by the government to recall television sets because they have three fires per 100,000 television sets. In our operating room, we have an automatic monitor system with an oscilloscope that's quite like a TV set. We have five of these, and in three years, each one of them has caught fire. So the statistics of safety in this field is minuscule as compared to what the public is protected by the federal regulations in the television industry. There are structural problems to look to. 
Surgical lights do fall out of ceilings or are torn out of ceilings and fall on the patient and the team and cause injury. When a surgical light does not move easily, when it doesn't rotate properly, have it inspected. Do not use it. Do not try to push it. You may be inviting a disaster. Ceilings fall down, particularly hung ceilings. When the panels are displaced, when things don't look right, have them inspected before the ceiling falls on the patient and the team. It can be catastrophic. Another thing we've learned is to be certain that the operating room is located in an ideal spot in the hospital. It must be located as far as possible from various electrical installations. Transformer banks, distribution panels, electric machinery such as motors, elevator gear, x-ray equipment or laundry machines all add peak voltages to the power supply. They all add electronic noise which interferes with the safety and security of the patient who is being monitored. More recently, I've had an insight into another kind of safety in the operating room. I sit as chairman of the joint safety committees of the hospitals associated with the Harvard Medical School. We meet once a month to review the categories of accidents, and it's surprising to see that every month a dozen or more patients fall off of operating tables, fall off of litters in the operating room, and are injured. Their arms are pinched in the operating table. They come off the operating table with palsies of the radial nerve, wrist drop. They come off with perineal pauses. They come out with dislocated hips. They come out with symptoms referable to intervertebral discs that they didn't have preoperatively. We must learn to protect the unconscious patient from this kind of injury. He should never be abandoned unless he is restrained properly. We shouldn't force limbs to bend around posts where they won't go. We should be certain that we have mechanical ways of lifting patients from operating tables to beds or litters. These things we all are responsible for and only by recognizing the hazard, training our personnel and working hard at it can we assure the patient a safe course through the operating room which is really a jungle of hazards unless we work at eliminating each one of them. Now, Harold Luffman of Albert Einstein College of Medicine and William C. Beck of the Hahnemann Medical College of Philadelphia join Dr. Walter in a discussion of various problem areas found when the surgeon looks at operating room environment. Dr. Luffman, serving as moderator as well as discussant, starts things off this way. The first question we have, I think I would like to answer myself. What do you feel about scrub sweep used for a month or so and never replaced? I think this is being overcome by new equipment and by new developments. For example, I believe the days of the standard scrub brush and the foot-operated dispenser of liquid soap are over. I would hope so in any event. We have found that such soap dispensers are literal culture media and that the individually wrapped soap impregnated scrub brush is so much safer and saves the possibility of the contamination of a dispenser. Next of all, one would hope that we would go rapidly to a no faucet sink, one of which is available now on the market, in which nothing has to be pushed by feet, hands, elbows, or other parts of the body in order to start the water running, but it works by way of a proximity button so that there is no means of contamination and no standing column of water to become contaminated, especially the kind that are foot operated or knee operated in which a standing column of water sends out a stream of bacteria for the first several minutes of the water flow. Dr. Beck, what about nose and throat cultures on surgeons? I don't know that the culture of the nose and throat of the surgeon is going to help a very great deal. I don't know that nose and throat cultures are tremendously valuable. I think they have one wonderful aspect, and that is that they make us alert to our problems and be considerably more careful and realize that our techniques are only to a certain extent permissive of our errors. <laughs>
Our techniques will forgive a certain amount of contamination. Many of our patients will forgive a certain amount of contamination, but we shouldn't challenge that forgiveness too hard. And if nose and throat cultures will alert the staff to the problems of asepsis, then I think they're worthwhile. Now, Dr. Walter? I'd like, like to disagree. Good. I think nose and throat cultures are only of assistance in a hospital if you intend to do something about them when they're positive. Just to fill a book full of records of what kind of bacteria you find in people's noses is a big waste of time, clutters the laboratory, and runs up hospital expense. On the other hand, if you've got an infection control committee that has a good epidemiologic data gathering system, and you know when there are outbreaks of infection occurring, then it's very worthwhile to have a backlog of data so you know where to go and where to begin looking at a probable cause. It can save you a great deal of time and energy. That also implies that when you find the surgeon is the carrier, that you have some means of having his carriage studied and corrected. But if you can't do that, don't have an infection control committee and don't waste everybody's time with cultures. You've got to have something to do with these data to make it worthwhile and make it pay off. Otherwise, you know, the cost of caring for a patient in the operating room with all these disposable soaps, brushes, everything else costs more than the average insurance company pays the surgeon for doing the operation. And this gets to be quite foolish. Dr. Walter, without a mop, in the operating room, how do you recommend that the floor be cleaned between cases? I'm not so particularly anxious that the floor be clean between cases. I think if we wipe up obvious contamination and spillage with a freshly laundered short string mop, we're doing as much as we need do. A sterile floor usually stays sterile pretty well and you can recognize the blood and the spillage without the big fuss of the complete room being mopped. There are hospitals who even use vacuum cleaners for getting rid of the spillage, but I'm willing to compromise this little bit with a short string mop, which is kept new and is used as a dry mop, taken out and dry and discarded the laundry immediately, and not allowed to rot in a pail of water in a janitor's closet, as a reasonable expedient. The point is that if we get rid of the particulate matter, the lint and the abraded string once a day with a wet vacuum pickup, our load of particulates will be minimal. Another question right back to you, Dr. Walter. How do you feel about lining a sponge bucket with a plastic bag, either in a contaminated case or otherwise? What about the conductivity? There's no hazard with this technique. Any type of an inexpensive plastic bag draped into the bucket before the anesthesia starts and used throughout the operating room is perfectly safe, provided the person who's using it has conductive footwear. There is no hazard here. This represents some of the overkill and the overexpense of maintaining an operating room. I can go into the electrostatics of this if you wish, but it would take time and I'm sure it wouldn't accomplish any more than if I tell you it is safe. You know, we don't wear conductive rubber gloves, I'd like to remind you, Harold. And this would be a very logical thing if you went all the way with electrostatics. But the fact that we have a nice, warm, wet human hand inside the glove makes it reasonably safe because it's capacitive coupled to whatever we handle on the outside, and we get along with this without hurting anybody. So let's not treat the kick pail any different than the surgeon's hand. And that brings up the next question here, which reads, what should relative humidity be in the operating room? And I think, Dr. Waller, you might just continue on that score. I think relative humidity in the operating room ought to be maintained at 50%. It would be better for the patient if we maintained it at 75%. But that gets to be uncomfortable for occupants and also in cold areas it means you have to have a special kind of a structure to keep the outer walls of the hospital from being disrupted by frost. 50% is easy to do, it's not disruptive, and it's not uncomfortable. I would also remind you that there are codes and guidelines on these points, such as relative humidity and temperature and electrical safety, flammability and explosive safety, put out 
and periodically revised by the NFPA. And these booklets are available at uh, something like 50 or 75 cents, or perhaps a dollar a quarter for some, each with a slightly different title. Then there is a compendium of all of them put together. How does a nurse deal with the situation in which the modern trend for surgeons is to have long hair, sideburns, and beards? Dr. Beck. A friend of mine wouldn't let a bearded intern into his operating room, and he was brought before the board of trustees of his hospital, and he said that he was perfectly willing to let the bearded intern into his operating room if he had a special mask designed to completely enclose his beard. I think, again, we have to deal with motivation, and I think we have to be insistent on trying to develop a rapport between the people who work together. To be very realistic about it, what we've instituted is the rule that anyone, be he surgeon, house staff, or anyone with long sideburns, beard, or such, wear a Mayo hood type of mask, the type that covers the head and face and neck and leaves the eyes available. And without that, they just can't work, period. Now, there has been enough work to realize that hair is a very important carrier of contamination. I think that doesn't have to be pursued. Although, yeah, you know, this, some this of our famous surgeons of days of yore, J.B. Murphy and uh, many others, had long beards, and I'm not sure what happened in those days. But, well, uh, Gustav Neubauer first introduced the concept of the head enclosure to keep beards and all this kind of hirsute individual out of the room way back in 1888, so that it's not a new problem. It's just a question of applying antiquity to a modern situation. Well, well Dr. Walter, you've really gone into a bumblebee hive here with your comment about alcohol. I've suddenly got four questions here related to alcohol. Let me read one. Dr. Walter, it says, really, comma, now, comma, do you imagine that you can disinfect hands with alcohol, question mark? Do you know how long alcohol must remain in contact with an object to disinfect it? I know from skin studies by the thousands that the application of a little acidified alcohol will remove all the surface bacteria by the time it evaporates from the hand. It is the single most effective way of disinfecting hands. Anybody wants to visit my laboratory, I'll give them a ton of data to show them what it's all about. If you add some quaternary or some hexachlorophene, it's even more effective. I won't even ask that. Isopropyl alcohol or ethyl alcohol, 70%, they're enormously effective, they're kind to the skin, and they do stop the digital and manual transmission of contamination. Much better, much more effective, and much more kind to the skin than what we call hand washing. What about drying the hands afterward? Well, I like to see them just let them evaporate, which it does very quickly. Dr. Walter, do you permit a scrub nurse to wash the instruments to any degree prior to terminal sterilization? Oh, I think that's just a waste of time. The gown glove nurse ought to put them into a tray or a bucket and get them into a sterilizer and sterilize them so they're safe to clean. They can then be cleaned mechanically or ultraviolet cleanser or handled by anybody but the occupational hazard is eliminated by heat. All right. Please discuss the use of disposable drapes as a bacteria barrier during surgery. I have no quarrel whatsoever with disposable drapes as bacteriologic barriers. I think they do it better than most textiles. I do think that they tear on the bias. I think they pill when you use them a great deal. They don't drape very well. My big quarrel is that they're inordinately expensive. An ordinary surgical gown which goes through our Associated Hospitals laundry on the linen service basis costs 28 cents for round trips through the sterilizer and back to the field. That same gown purchased costs $1.75. They'll keep adding costs, disposable brushes, one-shot germicides, all this thing it soon becomes economically unfeasible to get sick. And there are less expensive ways of reusing some equipment than having, for example, completely disposable anesthesia gear now. Always saving labor, but who pays for it? And isn't there a time when economics must be considered? Bill Beck? 
I had a good bit to do with the introduction of the disposable drape, and I would very, very much welcome some method of rendering a textile drape which can be reused. A dry drape is a perfectly valuable and valid barrier, but a wet one is no good at all. And if we could get some method by which we could waterproof this cloth drape, I would accept it. I've written an article in the Textile Research Journal begging for information on methodology for waterproofing a cloth or textile reusable drape. None has been available that will withstand repeated washing. And if we could do something about it, it'd be worthwhile. Now, I think that possibly the use of gluon plastic barrier in a small area might be enough to protect the wound. I think that there are areas where we should save expense. I think that the disposability causes a tremendous problem with how to get rid of it. That disposing of the single-use items is itself a terrific problem. But there are places where we can economize, and I don't personally feel that draping is one of the places that we should economize. I think there are lots of other areas where we can save. On the other hand, Bill, if textile drapes were such a hazard, it's very difficult to explain that statistical fact that many hospitals operate with an overall post-operative infection rate critically accumulated of less than 2%. And any hazard that small can't result from using something that's patently hazardous like a textile drape. I think that properly used with double thicknesses, 180 mesh material instead of open gauze, our various techniques that get us where we want to go. As you can see, there are some problems that there are answers to, and other problems that are far from solution, and there remains a great deal of serious and dedicated work to be done to bring the operating room environment to a better, perhaps, and if not better, at least newer level of performance. Thank you. The conclusion of the discussion also signals the end of this side of your program, Doctor. On side B, we'll hear two outstanding papers presented at this ACS meeting. And to hear this, simply flip over the cassette or two reels on your tape recorder. Continuing a special report from the American College of Surgeons sectional meeting in Washington, D.C., this is Audio Digest Surgery, Volume 17, Number 9. Next, the first of two clinical papers presented at this meeting. Stanley J. Dudrick of the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, outlining the use of hypertonic solutions in parenteral nutrition of critically ill patients. Nutrition in the care of the critically ill surgical patient has been an item of much importance to us all in the management of seriously ill patients for many years. And it's obvious that for years we have lagged behind in the metabolic and nutritional support of patients in keeping up with the rapid and fantastic technical advances that have been made, particularly in the last two decades. It's been our interest at the University of Pennsylvania Surgical Department and Harrison Department of Surgical Research for 30 or 40 years, starting with Dr. Ravden and then Dr. Rhodes and others, to try to improve parenteral means of nutrition because, after all, in surgery, parenteral nutrition is often the key metabolic item between success and failure. In an attempt to try to improve nutrition parenterally in patients who cannot use their gastrointestinal tract, we have had to go to hypertonic solutions in an attempt to get all of the nutrients into a patient within the 24 hours that are required for good nutrition and metabolic support. We all know that the best way to get your nourishment is by the gastrointestinal tract, but frequently, even with uh, jejunostomy feedings or gastrostomy feedings or what limited amounts that might be taken by mouth, we simply can't keep up with the catabolism which goes on in patients with major surgical problems or following major surgery or the complications that often come after them. The use of central veins and uh, hypertonic solutions has allowed us to give uh, patients on an average of about 3,000 to 3,500 calories a day without much difficulty and has allowed us to carry patients through critical illnesses in a much better metabolic state than we have had in previous years. This has been a technique which has evolved out of necessity, more or less, simply because we didn't have the use of high caloric density intravenous fat, nor have we had any other technique which would allow us to give all the nutrients by vein within water metabolism limits of the kidney and the cardiovascular tree.
The technique of making the hypertonic solution dry method is made in the pharmacy in which we add 165 grams of anhydrous USP glucose to each 860 cc of commercially available protein hydrolyzate and then push this through a membrane filter, another millipore filter of larger diameter to sterilize it and you end up with a thousand calories in a thousand cc's with about six grams of nitrogen or approximately 40 grams of protein equivalent per bottle. The wet method is simply a poor method in which our nurses or our pharmacists or doctors might uh, do this on the floors, in which we pour out 250 cc's from a liter commercially available bottle, and to that 750 we add 350 of 50% sugar, also purchased in bulk in 500 ml bottles, and doing it as aseptically as possible and preferably under a laminar flow filtered air hood, we then end up having hopefully a sterile solution with 1100 cc's and 1000 calories, a little less nitrogen, but still in the same ballpark. And in reality, we use these interchangeably. What we add to each bottle, regardless of the method of its preparation, in the average surgical patient, uh, approximately 40 to 50 milliequivalents of sodium and about 30 to 40 milliequivalents of potassium must be added to these bottles and about four to five milliequivalents of magnesium, which can either be added to each bottle or in case of the magnesium, you can actually add it to one of the bottles, double or triple the dose, depending upon how many calories you're trying to get into each patient. The vitamins, which we add to any one of the bottles, and this simply represents a half of an amp or an amp of MVI, which is the only perennial vitamin I know that contains the fat solubles as well as the water soluble vitamins, at least A, D, and E of the fat soluble. And generally, people who require intensive nutritional support also need uh, the fat soluble vitamins in addition to the B and C complex that we're used to giving the surgical patients who are generally fed for less than three weeks by vein. Optional additives are generally added to one unit or given sub Q or IM depending on the situation. Of course, in an infant, we have to add all of the constituents to all of the bottles since there are no reserve nutrients. Vitamin K, B12, and folic acid can either be given IM or IV. Iron can either be given to the patient in the form of blood if the hemoglobin is below 10. If you do have a satisfactory hemoglobin, and, and I would suggest that anybody who try feeding patients with this technique first get cardiovascular stability either by putting albumin or blood into the system first so that once you do have an adequate blood volume, then you go ahead and feed them. During periods of shock, of course, you should stop the feeding program because you're going to have relative intolerance to the handling of sugar and amino acids anyway and you may get the patient hyperosmotic. Therefore, during acute cardiovascular embarrassment, you ought to get them in a shape first, and then once you have them stable, then worry about the feeding. Calcium and phosphorus are added only if the serum values are low. Osteoporotic women particularly may need some. Infants, of course, need it all the time. The average adult nutrient components 25 to 3,500 ml is what we aim to get into the average adult with about 25 to 3,500 calories and 125 to 150 milliequivalents of sodium, 75 to 120 of potassium. And notice that your potassium has to be higher because if you're gonna make cells, you have to get the intracellular cation of greatest concentration potassium in there. And as you all know, if you add just simple hypertonic glucose to a normal patient by vein, it'll drive potassium into the cells. And if you don't get used to adding a little more potassium than you have been with your routine IVs, while well, you'll get hypokalemia and may run into one of the cardiovascular complications of that. The special diet that we have been using with renal failure patients which contains only the L-essential amino acids, the eight L-essential amino acids, which are known to be required for adult man. In infants, of course, you need arginine and histidine, and we haven't worked with the infants. But by giving 6.35 grams of the L-essential amino acids to patients in renal failure, we can get that into 100 ml of the solution. And by using 50% or 70% dextrose, within fluid limits imposed by complete anuria, and simply by replacing insensible loss, we can get 1,500 to 2,500 calories per day into a patient in complete renal failure and by so doing improve their nutritional status and indeed have had patients lower their BUNs considerably by doing this. The technique of subclavian catheterization we think is very important for the feeding technique in which the mid-clavicle is identified after adequate prepping and local anesthetic. A two-inch long needle of a large intracath is placed into the subclavian vein. The needle goes in parallel to the patient's back or frontal plane or bed and get the deltoid prominences out of the way by having the patient throw his shoulders back and reach for his feet with his hands if he can cooperate. Turn the head sharply to the opposite direction to lift the clavicle off the first rib and then aim for the top of the sternal notch or put your finger in there and aim for your finger. You can generally get into the subclavian vein on the first thrust. And once you get blood back and you're sure that the whole beveled tip is within the lumen of the vein, detach the apparatus, put in a catheter, and then take your needle out and sew it in. Put some antibiotic ointment on and a sterile occlusive dressing. And using such a 
catheter. We've uh, had three patients on single catheters for 90 days. We average over 40 days in our infants before any evidence of temp elevation or other indication for removing the catheter is present. The care that we have to go through uh, every three days in order to maintain asepsis and antisepsis around the catheter insertion site, we take off the dressing. For our own convenience, we take them off Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. The nurse, using a uh, no-touch technique with sterile instruments, cleaning off the skin with ether or acetone. The application of 2% tincture of iodine or methylate, and this is the exact same technique we use when we're prepping initially. The application of antibiotic ointment, any type of antibiotic ointment we've used seems to work well. A little pledge of gauze. The application of tincture of benzoin, which you think is important to keep the dressing occlusive and to keep the skin in good shape. Changing the intravenous tubing, including the junction of the intravenous tubing, the catheter, and the needle in one piece of tape so that it doesn't inadvertently come apart. We can take care of rather critically ill patients with judicious application of total intravenous nutrition. And I think that it's an excellent technique to at least have some mastery of because there are simply some patients that regardless of what you do surgically or pharmacologically, they are not going to make the grade unless we can support them metabolically and nutritionally. And although I'm not saying that this is the best technique for intravenous feeding, it certainly is one that works now in this country. And until we can get better solutions and better techniques for delivering them, we do have a method which will work, which will help you to get some patients through that ordinarily would not make it and no longer justify allowing patients who can't make it because of lack of nutrition die simply because we can't feed them by gut. In his paper on advances and controversies in surgery of the esophagus, David Burnt Skinner of Johns Hopkins provides some practical pointers in the surgical treatment of hiatal hernia and reflux, peptic stricture, carcinoma of the esophagus, esophageal diverticula, and bleeding esophageal varices. Dr. Skinner? Starting with hiatal hernia, this is now becoming recognized as an extremely common condition. As many as 10 million people in the United States today are estimated to have this diagnosis established. Clearly, the vast majority of these do not need treatment of any sort. Those who unquestionably do need surgery include patients with large or parahiatal hernias, which are in the jeopardy of complications common to any large hernia, which are obstruction, strangulation, bleeding, acute intrathoracic gastric dilatation. These large hernias are easily identified and are uncommon so that they do not present a major clinical problem. A much more difficult problem is the patient having a small hiatal hernia. Once it is understood that it is reflux and not the hiatal hernia, which determines the likelihood of complications such as esophagitis, stricture, bleeding, or aspiration pneumonia, and determines the need for treatment, then the approach to this disorder is greatly simplified. I'd like to emphasize that reflux may occur in the absence of a hiatal hernia. Esophagoscopy remains the cornerstone for the diagnosis of esophagitis, which is a pathological diagnosis requiring gross or microscopic observation of the esophagus. In patients with esophagitis severe enough to cause ulceration and destruction of the mucosa, the risk of complications such as bleeding and stricture is increased. These patients are selected immediately for surgical treatment of their reflux problem. All other patients with less severe esophagitis are treated medically and become surgical candidates only if medical therapy fails to relieve their symptoms. Now with these indications in mind, surgery is designed to prevent esophageal reflux and its complications and not just repair the hiatal hernia. The older techniques of hiatal hernia repair such as those introduced by Sweet, Harrington, or Allison, gave reasonable results in terms of hiatal hernia correction radiologically, but these repairs allowed continued reflux in at least a third or more of the patients. Principles important in the surgical operations to prevent reflux include the presence of an intra-abdominal segment of esophagus, an esophageal gastric flap valve mechanism, reapproximation of the diaphragm around the lower esophagus, preservation of the muscular and mucosal and innervation functions of the cardia, and the division of the phrenoesophageal membrane, and then finally approximation of the hiatus to prevent the reconstruction from sliding back up into the chest. Several repairs have been described and evaluated which incorporate most of these features. Although the repairs differ in the details of technique, each accomplishes the reduction of approximately four centimeters of esophagus 
below the diaphragm and fixes it there by various maneuvers. The Belsey Mark IV technique, the esophagus is held below the diaphragm by two rows of stitches between the fundus of the stomach and the esophagus, anchoring the second row through the diaphragm and closing the diaphragmatic crust posteriorly. This repair is done through a thoracic incision, which is advantageous in obese patients and in those with severe esophagitis or recurrent disease in whom scarring may make extensive mobilization of the esophagus necessary. Postoperatively, the intra-abdominal segment of the esophagus is readily seen in these patients, and this is the hallmark of a successful reflux operation. Pre- and postoperative evaluation by the esophageal function tests have demonstrated restoration of a gastroesophageal high pressure zone and excellent control of reflux by this repair. The Nissen fundoplication operation has also provided satisfactory control of reflux. In this operation, the fundus of the stomach is wrapped around the esophagus in the intra-abdominal portion. The diaphragm is then closed posteriorly to prevent the reconstruction from sliding back into the chest. Collis in Birmingham, England, introduced a technique which employed sutures between the gastroesophageal junction and the origins of the diaphragm posteriorly in front of the aorta. By closing the diaphragm in front of the esophagus, the intra-abdominal segment became wrapped in a long muscle tunnel. Lucius Hill of Seattle described a repair which employs sutures between the gastroesophageal junction and the arcuate ligament overlying the aorta posteriorly to hold the intra-abdominal segment of esophagus in place. The diaphragm was closed posteriorly and sutures may be added to tack the fundus of the stomach around the intra-abdominal esophagus. The abdominal approach is indicated in patients with atypical abdominal symptoms or other conditions requiring treatment, most commonly cholecystitis or duodenal ulcer. Each of these repairs has been evaluated in a substantial number of patients and the results are all in the range of less than 10% recurrences and 90% long-term control of herniation and reflux. When the operative procedures successfully prevent gastric contents from refluxing into the esophagus, an acid-reducing or gastric drainage procedure is not necessary or indicated to treat esophagitis. These procedures are reserved for patients who have specific indications such as peptic ulcer disease. Because of the secondary shortening of the esophagus, hiatal hernia repair and reconstruction of the cardia are rarely possible or successful in treating strictures. A combination of bougenage with intensive medical therapy is advocated by many and may be sufficient treatment for the patient who has an early stricture with fibrosis limited to the submucosa. If recurrence of the stricture occurs rapidly, and the risk and discomfort of bougenage become intolerable to the patient and physician, then surgery for stricture becomes necessary. The definitive operation for peptic stricture is resection of the damaged segment and reconstruction, preferably with a left colon segment interposition. This has supplanted the esophageal gastric anastomosis, and the colon interposition has the advantage of both removing the disease and preventing postoperative reflux. By using the colon interposition to lengthen the esophagus, a reconstructive operation can be performed. Now this is an operation of great magnitude and relies on a favorable mesentery and blood supply to the bowel for its success. When the colon interposition is performed in good risk patients, the mortality is acceptably low and the long-term control of reflux has been excellent. In Belsey's experience now in excess of 150 colon interpositions for stricture, and in my own much smaller experience, problems of recurrent esophagitis or colitis and stricturing of the anastomoses have not been encountered. These results are clearly superior to those obtained using esophageal gastrostomy as a form of reconstruction. Because of the magnitude of the resection and interposition operations, other reconstructions have been developed. Collis described a repair in which the esophageal tube was lengthened by cutting an extension down the lesser curvature of the stomach. This provides the additional length necessary to restore an intra-abdominal segment of the digestive tube, which will prevent reflux into the stricture, which is then dilated postoperatively. Good results have been achieved in approximately three quarters of the 60 patients reported. Fall proposed cutting across the stricture to lay it wide open and then patch the opening with the serosa of the stomach 
with or without a skin graft. Woodward has reported a high incidence of reflux following the thaw procedure when the reconstruction is left in the chest. By incorporating the maneuvers used in the Nissen fundal plication operation, Woodward found that the reflux following the thaw procedure was greatly reduced. Although this operation is effective for many patients, restricture and reflux have been encountered and the long-term results are as yet unknown. Among the many procedures advocated for treatment of peptic stricture, I believe that bougenage and medical therapy should be attempted first. If unsuccessful, the good risk patient is best treated by resection of the stricture with a short segment colon interposition. In a poor risk patient in whom the multiple anastomoses required for a bowel interposition are not desirable, the thaw operation with the Woodward Nissen modification appears to be the best compromise procedure. With further experience, indications for this operation may be broadened. Now, treatment for carcinoma of the esophagus is more unsettled at present than in the past, as the results of radiotherapy have clearly improved with the use of cobalt units. One stage resection and reconstruction remains the procedure of choice for adenocarcinoma of the cardia or lower esophagus, as this tumor is relatively insensitive to radiotherapy and the local anatomy is favorable for a surgical block dissection. When at least a five centimeter margin can be achieved above the tumor, reconstruction by esophageal gastrostomy is performed. Esophageal reflux is a hazard of this reconstruction. Treatment for squamous carcinoma of the lower two-thirds of the esophagus is more controversial. Several encouraging reports from high-voltage radiotherapy alone have been presented. Four of 25 patients treated by Watson survived five years. Others have reported that the results in patients treated with radical radiotherapy were equivalent to those for patients undergoing resection. If preoperative evaluation of a middle third carcinoma indicates that it may be a favorable lesion in a good risk patient, a combination of radiotherapy and surgery should be considered. These methods appear complementary rather than competitive in their effects. Radiotherapy or bypass of the tumor are undertaken as the first two stages. Resection of the tumor is performed later. I prefer a substernal colon interposition to bypass the esophagus and evaluate the presence of intra-abdominal disease. If no metastases are found, the primary tumor is given approximately 3,000 rads, followed by total esophagectomy and a block dissection of the entire posterior mediastinum. This is done several weeks after radiotherapy. At any stage in the treatment when metastases are discovered, the three-stage combined treatment is abandoned and the palliation provided by the colon bypass is sufficient. Reports using combinations of radiation and surgery from Nakayama and colleagues and Akakura and associates in Japan and Parker and Gregory in this country have clearly demonstrated that the resectability rate is increased by preoperative radiation therapy. Their results suggest that the survival rates at two and five years are increased for the small number of patients who have been followed for this length of time following the combined therapy. For patients who are not candidates for the three-stage procedures and in whom rapid palliation with early discharge from the hospital is desired, primary surgical resection of middle third lesions may be undertaken. I prefer to do this entirely through a right thoracotomy, mobilizing the stomach through the esophageal hiatus in the manner developed by Belsey. Others prefer to mobilize the stomach through a separate laparotomy incision. Individual vessels are clamped and ligated as they appear through the hiatus. Sufficient stomach can be mobilized through the hiatus to make an anastomosis at the base of the neck and a subtotal esophagectomy with block dissection of the mediastinum can be performed. Recently, we've been incorporating an esophagogastric anastomosis which wraps some of the stomach around the esophagus, and this was shown to me by Dr. Richard Kiefer in Baltimore, and this seems to have reduced the reflux problem after this kind of high esophagogastric anastomosis. A recent report by Wilson and Plested and Carey has emphasized the palliative value of resection for middle third carcinomas in spite of spread of the disease away from the local area. Of 20 patients treated by resection, they had one operative death. All the remaining patients had satisfactory relief of dysphagia until dying from their disease. By contrast, only four of 20 patients given radiotherapy had relief of dysphagia. Three developed tracheoesophageal fistulas 
and two, develop perforations into the mediastinum. In my opinion, radiotherapy for middle third lesions should be reserved for patients who are prohibitive surgical risks or in whom the local extent of disease interferes with a surgical reconstruction. When the disastrous complications of a tracheoesophageal fistula develop spontaneously or during radiotherapy, two treatments have been employed with some success. In two patients, I've been able to position the Musso barban tube in a location so that the side of the tube lay against the fistula and prevented drainage of swallowed material into the lungs. An alternative procedure is substernal colon bypass with division of the esophagus above the fistula. Dr. Vaughn Belcher at the Public Health Service Hospital in Baltimore recently had a spectacular success with such a procedure in a patient with a tracheoesophageal fistula. If the patient has reflux, the cardio must also be divided, counting on the fistula itself to decompress the mucus secretion of the remaining esophagus. For esophageal carcinomas above the level of the aortic arch, radiation therapy remains the procedure of choice as these tumors are usually squamous cell and located in a place where dosimetry can be planned effectively and with minimal damage to the surrounding tissues. In rare patients with localized tumors who are favorable surgical candidates, a resection of the entire esophagus up to the level of the pharynx may be undertaken with the interposition of a long segment of colon Management of esophageal diverticula has again become controversial. Following the reports of Sweet in 1956 and Claggett and Payne in 1960, the excellent results obtained with the one-stage resection of the Fringo esophageal diverticula established this as the procedure of choice. However, other reports have described a disturbing incidence of diverticulum recurrence or leakage from the suture line with fistula formation and mediastinitis. Nagus suggested that dysphagia is the cause of the diverticulum and not the result. Several reports have described small numbers of patients treated by cricopharyngeal myotomy. Belsey reported excellent results in 32 patients in whom pharyngeoesophageal myotomy was performed. In those with large sacs, diverticular pexy was added to the procedure, but none of the pouches were resected. At Johns Hopkins, Dr. Charles Siegel and I have studied and treated five patients with pharyngeoesophageal diverticula in the past two years. Forehead elevations of the resting cricopharyngeal pressure and failure of complete sphincter relaxation in response to a swallow. Each was treated by myotomy and diverticular pexy without resection, and the clinical results to date have been excellent. By eliminating the hazards of an esophageal suture line and correcting whatever abnormality exists in the cricopharyngeus muscle, it appears that surgery for this condition can be improved. For diverticula occurring at the lower esophagus, there is more general agreement on the need for myotomy as esophageal spasm has been clearly demonstrated. The marked improvement in results obtained by Allen and Claggett when myotomy was added to diverticulectomy for lower esophageal diverticula was impressive. Complications were significantly diminished in the group treated by myotomy, and others have confirmed this experience. In the treatment of bleeding esophageal varices, our last topic, portosystemic shunt operations remain the most effective and widely used procedures. However, in patients who are not suitable for emergency shunts because of extrahepatic portal vein obstruction, post-shunt bleeding, small portal veins, variceal bleeding not diagnosed until the time of surgery, or in poor risk for shunt surgery because of hepatic encephalopathy, direct interruption of esophageal varices may be employed. A number of operations have been devised for this purpose, but none has become widely accepted. Transesophageal suture of bleeding varices, of which Dr. Linton was one of the early advocates, controls bleeding acutely, but is followed by a high incidence of re-bleeding and the risk of leakage from the esophageal suture line. More extensive operations, such as esophageal gastrectomy, gastric or esophageal transection proposed by Milnes Walker, or the portoazagous disconnection described by Tanner, reduce the likelihood of recurrent bleeding, but require an esophageal anastomosis and may cause gastroesophageal reflux and esophagitis postoperatively. And this concludes this Audio Digest special report. Our thanks to all participants and to the governing board of the American College of Surgeons for cooperation in recording and disseminating this material.
Your next issue of Audio Digest Surgery, Volume 17, Number 10, features a comprehensive panel discussion on intensive care units, monitors, and surgical patients with Francis D. Moore, John W. Kirkwin, John M. Kinney, Walter D. Gaysford, and James V. Maloney, Jr. Until that issue, thank you, Doctor, for listening.